It is a truth universally acknowledged. I myself have noticed my growing resemblance to a daffodil. That is gold. Does not glitter. Not how I would die. Not all. Though I had reason enough in the last few months. If you want to rebel, rebel from inside the system. But because they tell us that dragons. I'm your host, Vicky, from Miss Vicky's Bookcase. Let's begin our story together. Hello and welcome to Miss Vicky's Bookcase. Oh, it's so exciting. I'm so excited to share with you the book I'm reviewing today because, oh. I've really enjoyed it so, so much. And I feel like I've just told you my entire review in like 10 seconds or less. But it is worth listening to. Now, you may have never heard of this book, but I read it a year or two ago and I felt like I need something different. So I decided, you know what? I'll reread it. The last book's just come out. I can't remember currently. I can remember vaguely what happened in the first book, but I'd really like to reread the entire thing and then enjoy the last book fully remembering what's happened. That was a deep, deep, deep hole that I decided to dig myself into. Now, the book I'm talking about is Navigating the Stars by Maria V. Schneider. Now, if you've never heard of her before, um, Maria V. Schneider, and I, I love I love her background. Um, it's so funny. She's actually a meteorologist, and born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the USA. She dreamt of chasing tornadoes and even earned a bachelor's degree of science in meteorology, hence, uh, but unfortunately she lacked the necessary forecasting skills. However, she did work as an environmental meteorologist until boredom and children drove her to write down the stories that had been swirling around her head. So she decided that she would return to school and earn a Master of Arts degree in fiction writing from Seton Hill University. And unable to part company with Seton Hill and its wonderful writing programme, Maria is currently a teacher and a mentor for the MFA programme. So she's quite an interesting person and I kind of really enjoy the fact that she's got a kind of weather background and this is kind of reflected in some of her earlier young adult novels. So do go and have a look at those to see what I mean. So... I thought before we just go into the summary of navigating the stars, I'd just give you two very extremely mild trigger warnings. One's very mild swearing. There are some bombs dropped, so to speak, but they are very few and far between and they are in context. And the other is extremely so mild, I almost didn't mention it. Kissing, a little bit making out. I mean, this is a young adult novel and considering the fact that this is a YA and I know other YAs, not mentioning any names, have far more than this. This is so mild, it's almost not worth mentioning, but it is still worth mentioning a tiny bit. Moving on to the summary, um, it starts, Terracotta warriors have been discovered on other planets in the Milky Way galaxy. And Lara Daniels' parents are the archaeological experts, yes, with the capital E on the warriors, and have dragged her to the various planets to study them, despite the time dilation causing havoc with her social life. One of the many warrior planets goes silent and looters attack her research base. Lara becomes involved in discovering why the warriors were placed on these planets, and more importantly, by who. I'm going to pause there a second to let you soak in that summary you done can you believe it warrior terracottas the chinese terracotta warriors are oh, can you imagine that in space why they're there how did they get there oh this is this just pulls all my strings because i am a former archaeologist yeah that's right i have a degree in archaeology and the thought of these terracotta warriors being there and this being all about archaeology and space, she had me right there and I'm so very, very excited. I'm trying to be calm about this because if I get too excited, I'll squeal so high you won't be able to hear anything at all and all I'll be doing is saying gibberish. So we're going to start with our characters a little bit. Uh, and this is where I want to talk about Lyra. Lyra, I really loved her. She was funny and a bit on the sarcastic side. But I really enjoyed the genuine enthusiasm for life and really wanting to help. She, I wouldn't say she's a goody two-shoes, although she's pretty close to it. But I really like the fact that she genuinely does things because she wants to help. And the other thing is, is that she's also almost this bad girl kind of thing. But not really at the same time. So I should, I should explain really. So in this story, basically... Lara gets told by her parents that they're going to this planet called Yin Jin. I'm going to say it very wrong because they're all Chinese names. So I'm going to try and pronounce them correctly. So generally what happens is once stuff has been done or rather they've got to a certain point in the archaeology and exploration, people are moved on to the next warrior planet. Some are 
lucky to stay behind just to carry on doing stuff but her parents were basically told they're going to be the expedition leaders. Now to get to this planet you have to go via something called the crinkle point which basically means you think of a piece of paper and you've got to get from one side of the piece of paper to the other and to do that this crinkle point basically squishes the paper together kind of like a concertina and it kind of leapfrogs onto the other side. Now the problem with this is that there is a time dilation problem. So even though Lyra and her parents are going now, they're not going to get there in 50 days and it's, you know, 50 days and that's all they miss. This is a 50 years type thing. So by the time that Lyra comes, uh, gets out of the ship at the other end, it's going to be 50 years since she actually saw anyone that's on the planet that she's currently on and so on and so forth. This is what causes a problem. And really for the kids that have to go through this again and again and again, it's very hard and in fact they do conduct mini funerals for any child that goes this is something that the adults don't know about but that is very much reflective that when the children part they count them as basically dead to them because they're going so many years into the future that they're not going to see them again and this actually is something that becomes quite a problem further on in the books uh, all three books i've read all three by the way all three very good and I like the fact that they have this big major problem and it does have a massive impact on what people do, how people react and I don't really want to give away too much but this does have a big implication. Now with Lyra the other thing is as well is that she's been taught something called worming and this basically means that think about a hacker in this day and age and they hack into a website and do different things. It's very similar with worming but in a very different way because they have something called the QNet which is massive. This is what helps them to travel to different places. It's like the internet but so much more. It's really hard to explain. It's easier to read about it because otherwise I'm going to go into a long description. And Lyra has actually learned how to worm from her friend Jaren. Now I will mention Jaren in a minute because he's an interesting character, but she basically kind of has learnt how to worm. It's not exactly legal, let me put it that way. And she kind of gets in trouble because of this, because she gets caught worming, not once, but several times. And because of this, again, part of her actions that she did impact later on, if that makes sense. So she got caught worming on the ship and she basically was allowed to study with the navigator because the captain didn't want to see such talent be basically for an interdetention. She doesn't stop worming of course but this again this particular focal point again has an impact on her life and we'll talk about that in a second because the other thing is is that Something happens that brings her to the attention of the QNet. Now, this is going to sound a bit weird. So we're going to reverse back a little bit or rather go forward a little bit more in the story so you can see where I'm coming from. So when they get to the planet Yinjing, she, of course, has a letter from her friend Lan, who I haven't mentioned yet. But basically, when they had the funeral for her, her friend Lan was there. And you're not supposed to contact the person because you're going to be a different age and everything's all weird. But Lan does send her information and messages because Lan has worked out that the warriors have symbols on them and she actually worked it all out and she wants uh, Lyra to have the information so she can give it to her parents because people weren't really paying attention to Lan and that kind of thing. At the same time, the digging is going on in the warrior pit and they accidentally find this hole in the ground in one of the pits which actually leads to what we call the warrior factory where inside each warrior a heart is made which they didn't realize at the time. Lyra touches a heart even though she knows she shouldn't do she said uh, it's like an impulse type thing and she basically has this stabbing icicle and things start happening basically from there because we have the looters who come and attack because there's something going on. I mean, why would they really want to take the Terracotta Warriors? There's millions of them. They're on Earth as well. It seems a really odd thing, but they did. Um, the looters come during a stand sandstorm and Lyra instinctively covers the hole and protects the huts, almost getting killed for it. And it's this one action. Well, actually, it's a series of action, but this is the real focus point for Lyra because with her doing that, 
the QNet basically sits up and takes notice because she automatically protected something and it was a very scary thing to do. Uh, I suppose the term is good deeds don't go unpunished and from then on her world goes topsy-turvy because we have looters still trying to attack them. She's got this weird thing going on with the QNet whereas before you had to have these special entanglers as they call it um, and something inside your brain that's been surgically put there to be able to get onto the QNet. She kind of no longer needs this but that isn't the only reason why I like the story. I think so far it's I, I'm not going to go any further into the story because I feel like I don't want to give spoilers and tell the whole story because then what would be the point in reading it? But suffice it to say, it does get even more interesting. So now that I've talked about Lara a little bit, I just want to mention a couple of other characters because, again, it's not just about her. I just want to mention her parents, Spencer and Ming. Oh, finally, parents that are there that are authoritative, but they're full of lovingness and they are featured throughout this book. There's no absent parentism and that is so hard to find in any book really that of sci-fi and fantasy origin. Usually parents are absent or they die tragically or they're never seemingly there. This is totally different in this book because the parents are totally hands-on and I really enjoyed having that because it makes it seem more real. It, this felt like more real sci-fi than like some sci-fi where it's so unreal it's kind of not real this is very much almost feels like this could happen in my lifetime situation so that's why I really love this book so much because of the interaction with her parents which is great now the other thing to mention is for those who are sci-fi lovers but romance haters yes there is romance in here and the romantic interest is Neil and it he's a little bit grumpy at the beginning let's be honest he gets quite a bit grumpy and he can sometimes can be a bit jealous but you can't have a person who's perfect someone's got to have something somewhere and jealousy seems to be his thing a little bit but once admittedly he decided to like Lyra he really does like her and there is no hesitating I really love the fact that he believes in her and she has that kind of backup which again is really good to see I just really enjoyed the fact that they had this very sweet almost funny romance I wouldn't say it's enemies to lovers type situation because it most certainly wasn't it's more of a disinclination to suddenly slowly realizing actually they could be friends and it definitely got very quickly more and that's okay I don't mind that I don't mind a bit of insta love because I actually have seen it in real life so I'm not too worried from that aspect if you are more of a romance reader and you do like a bit of sci-fi it is nothing that is explicit or anything like that when I say sweet, I genuinely mean it's very sweet. And I enjoyed that. And for me, again, it was a great palate cleanser because I just finished Assassin's Apprentice. And it was just so nice to have something where it just felt like it wasn't a fight going on in the background. It was just a great support again. I really liked Neil. I like the fact that he was kind of like an artist as well. And that he was very good at it. I've seen other pictures about it in further on in one of the books. And again really enjoyed his character and even funnier is his dad because his dad is actually a security officer and one of the big messages that came through as soon as they came at the time dilation was the fact the planet that they'd been on had gone silent and that the father trace radcliffe i always say his last name wrong uh he was the security officer on the ship and they're better on the ship than the ones that go to the planet so they kind of swapped places which is why kind of Neil gets very grumpy because he doesn't want to go off the ship he's old enough almost he's like 10 days too early before he could ship off elsewhere and his dad wouldn't let him and not surprisingly because time dilation meant he probably wouldn't see him again but with Tace Radcliffe sorry coming back to uh, him he was called officer tight pants which made me laugh so much because he is very much the mentor in this story he's the wise man I really find him one of those where you know the ones that don't give it away the stern demeanor but he is a sweetheart in other ways and again I really liked it the only thing is and this is probably the big thing for me that I wasn't quite sure or I really I found it a little bit odd that her punishment was to go and live with the security officer 
it just smacked of something that was a little bit wrong but that was just me and I've just done online safety at work which is why I'm like oh that's a bit weird but nothing ever happens that's bad in that way I don't think it sounds really bad now I've said it out loud it it has nothing to do with that and it's probably me being a bit weird but really once I got over that kind of oddness I can see where they're coming from because she was caught worming again and her punishment oh by the way it was quite a bad worming in this particular case you she really shouldn't have done that and it was either go and be basically under the parole of the security officer's house or you go to detention and she wasn't really offered the detention I don't think anyone would want to be put in detention but um she's basically on parole at the senior uh security officer's house which was Tace Radcliffe's and of course that works from that perspective I just found it a little bit weird I'm just saying anyway moving on from that I did like the fact that Tace also saw the potential in Lyra and that he just didn't treat her like a petty criminal that was really good I really liked that and the way that she got treated was very different from her friend which is why I'm mentioning it so her friend Jaren basically taught her to worm and okay there is a problem with talking about Jaren too much is that I want to talk about him but at the same time there's going to be major spoilers so I'm going to try and keep this as vague as possible again because I seriously I don't want to spoil it for you because you know I mean okay I love knowing what's going to happen because I'm one of those that rushes through a book because I know that it can happen and then I have to read it again to get all the nuances um yeah I'm one of those kind of people but let, let's see if I can try and say something about Jaron without getting too much away now he too is sent away when he wanted to stay and the thing is he kind of ends up going out with her friend Lan and as you do sometimes at that age you know 16 17 she and he basically make promises and then he goes into the time dilation and he comes out and uh, Lan has moved on she's got married she's got two kids because he goes 20 years into the future and he found it a little bit hard he found well not a little bit hard he found it really really hard because he's still like 16 17 and she is like 30s it's really bizarre and this again is something that has a major impact if there wasn't any time dilation there wouldn't be any story and because of the choices he makes he almost goes the direct opposite to Lyra where he does carry on worming like her however he's not given the opportunities to prove his potential and it kind of goes a little bit downhill from that for him now I do feel like it's a little bit hard on him and the time dilation again is something that just has a major impact it's it's, it's hard to talk about him without trying giving too much away but do keep an eye on Jaren is what I'm going to say because he's sneaky 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 and I will give him credit he he does help Lyra and I don't I'm not going to say how he help, helps Lyra because again I feel like that's going to give it all away But he certainly does help Lyra and Lyra is one of those who is a really good person and I think she found it a little bit difficult to accept that he would do that. She does try and see the good in everyone as much as she can. It makes her sound like that she is uh, a Mary Jane. She most certainly isn't a Mary Jane. As I said, she worms, she does different things. She's very stubborn. And like any teenager, she does cause her parents a bit of heartache. But I think that's normal in teenagers. They're just trying to, uh, what's the term? Just trying to spread their wings a bit. So really, overall, the atmosphere of the book, I've really enjoyed the atmosphere. It wasn't spooky or anything like that. It does get very tense and I really like that. And this kind of leads nicely on to the writing, which is so easygoing, so very fast paced. I got through this book so very quickly, uh, like 24 hour quickly. Um, I might have been a little bit obsessed, but I'm not commenting on that. And the thing is, is what I really liked this about this book is for me it was a definite palette cleanser and so very very refreshing but at the same time it did keep me hooked it's not like it didn't keep me hooked I mean all the other books I've read this month I didn't feel like I 
was desperate to read on. I wanted to read on, but with this book, even though I've read it before and I knew what was going to happen, I was still eager to read the book, to know what happened next. And that was fantastic. It really kept me intrigued and needing to know what happened next. And well, there are things, if I look at the other two books from a, a little misty distance, I kind of didn't expect what came out of it a little bit but at the same time I really enjoyed all three and you didn't have the second book syndrome either with the second book and I did feel fairly satisfied with the conclusion of the entire series. I kind of wished that Maria V. Snyder would write more in this universe. I really enjoyed it. I think that's mostly because it was archaeology in space. I mean, I still can't get over that. That is so awesome. Let's think about that again. Terracotta warriors in space. It is fantastic. Now, moving on to the logic of the book. Offhand, I didn't see anything on the surface level that would really cause a lot of gaps. There are plenty of things, of course, that you don't know that aren't answered until the conclusion of the book. And that again is fine. Although I will mention just with my archaeology hat on, the fact that Lyra is getting these discoveries, you would have thought that they would have been able to do this themselves like way, way before. And the fact that they discovered the warrior factory offhand and the warriors actually had hearts in it. It's kind of a little bit, a little bit on the tiniest bit of far-fetchedness, but that's because I am an ex-archaeologist and I know how archaeology works, but at the same time, it's fine. Archaeology also has people who have found legendary treasure hoards. I'm thinking of the lost city of Troy and things like that. And it does happen, so I'm not too worried at the same time, but to me, it's a little bit sometimes a little bit far-fetched some of the things that she thinks of and the fact that she does give suggestions she's so bossy she's like why don't we do this and they do listen to her and take on board what she says and sometimes they don't agree with her and don't do it and well more often they do which makes me laugh a little bit she's 17 and she's kind of bossing them around a little <laughs> little if I'm thinking about it Anyway, as you can probably tell, this was a definite five star from me. A lot of people probably find it a bit too lightweight, but it was the whole premise of Terracotta Warriors, archaeology, the time dilation, adventure. It was one of those where we didn't really have morally grey characters, really. We had kind of like the good guy and the bad guy. And I really liked that. I'm getting a bit sick this sounds really bad i'm getting a bit sick where we have the morally gray where they head more towards the black side of morally gray and everyone's like isn't this amazing people aren't all good and all bad which i totally agree with but i just i just like to have sometimes a book where i can just enjoy the good guy being the good guy and the bad guy being the bad guy it's nice to have that it's quite refreshing especially in this day and age where gray morality rules yay Anyway, so it is a light-hearted read and it's not like, I mean, it's a chuckling light-hearted read. I mean, there are some great quotes that I've got from the book, including, this is one of my favourite, that jerk is not coming back and I want to spend more time with you. But I annoy you, part of the appeal. And I have a habit of breaking rules. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> I love that. It's great. Other than, it's called Denial Mom. Once you embrace the concept, you can believe anything. So I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the writing and it was more of an adventure that I just, ah, oh, as I said, it's so good to have something where we have a concept of the archaeology in space. That was great. And I felt it was a real unique, fun time. I found it really enjoyable and really fun. I also, again, really appreciated having the parents in this book, being there, being part of her life so fantastic. I admit I am struggling to find downsides other than that one bit I mentioned about her living in the security officer's house which again I can totally understand and a bit about the archaeology. There isn't really for me to, I don't know, I'm struggling to think of anything but if you have read the book and you can see anything that's really the bad side because you know I can't be all good. Please jump over to my Instagram page at Miss Vicky's Bookcase and send me a DM and let me know what you thought about it and what you thought was the big problem. Because this can't be perfect, can it? Can it? I mean, okay, if you don't like romance, that's probably where the big fail is. Because if you don't like romance, then this book is not for you because it is front and center. 
but it's not overpowering but it's funny it is sweet and yeah just try it anyway see if you can read through it it is a bit sickly sometimes but I needed that in all honesty after some of what I've read now I'm gonna end this podcast with just giving you five words that I feel like subscribe to the book and they go with fun fast-paced archaeology rocks okay that's two words but anyway aliens and troublemaker because she is a troublemaker so i hope you've enjoyed hearing about one of my new favorite books for this year navigating the stars by maria v schneider if you've really enjoyed it feel free again to jump over to my instagram page at miss vicky's bookcase and let me know how you feel i will see you in the next podcast the month of love is beginning very soon so we'll see what i'm gonna give you bye Ank Moorpork, Pearl of Cities. People really are this like houses is not with vast rooms and tiny Libraries rooms. were full of ideas, perhaps the most dangerous and powerful. She delighted in the smell of the ink, the rough fill of the paper. had commented once, that Neil had a gift that can for only making be someone enjoyed by children him. is Just not a good children's story. Very weak-minded, refused to be influenced by literature and poetry.